Madam Speaker, I'm making this statement today because my siblings, Dr. Lee Wei Ling and Mr. Lee Sien Yang, have made serious allegations of abuse of power against me and my government. The allegations seem to concern primarily three matters. One, the setting up of the Ministerial Committee on 38 Oxley Road. Two, the deed of gift for some artifacts from the house that were to be displayed in an exhibition by the National Heritage Board. And three, accusations of nepotism over my wife and son and accusations that I want my father's house kept standing to bolster my power. These allegations are entirely baseless, but they have already damaged Singapore's reputation and unrebutted they can affect Singaporeans' confidence in the government. I therefore have no choice but to address them promptly and publicly. I also have to do so in Parliament. Under the Constitution, the Prime Minister is the person who commands the confidence of the majority of the members of Parliament. As the PM, I have a duty to explain myself to MPs and to rebut in Parliament the allegations against me and my government. I know many Singaporeans are upset by this issue. They are tired of the subject and wish it would end. I too am upset that things have reached this state. As your Prime Minister, I deeply regret that this has happened and apologize to Singaporeans for this. As a son, I'm pained at the anguish that this strife would have caused my parents to feel if they were still alive. I intend to clear the air today to explain the matter fully and to answer all questions on the matter. I'm not here to make a case against my siblings. Parliament is not the place for that. What is private, I'll try to resolve privately, but what is public, I have to explain and render account. I stand by what I will say in this chamber. I shall be separately issuing whatever I say in this debate as a statement by me outside the House, which will not be covered by parliamentary privilege. To respond to these allegations of abuse of power, I will have to go into some background about 38 Oxley Road and the family discussions on the House so that members can make sense of the allegations. But my account will inevitably be from my perspective, so I will try my best to be objective and factual. I will cover the discussions on 38 Oxley Road when Mr. Lee Kuan Yew was alive, what happened after Ms. Lee passed away, and then where the matter stands today. Madam Speaker, may I now ask the clerk to distribute handout one to members? Yes, please. My father's wish, held for many years, is well known to all Singaporeans. He wanted the house at 38 Oxley Road to be demolished. After my mother died in 2010, my father wrote to the cabinet to put his position on the record. This is the first note you have in the bundle, which is dated 27th of October 2010. And it's a letter from Mr. Lee to cabinet, and it reads, 38 Oxley Road. I have discussed this with my family many a time. They agreed with me that 38 Oxley Road should not be kept as a kind of relic for people to tramp through. Take photos of it or whatever else they want, but demolish it after I'm gone. I've seen too many places which are kept frozen in time. My most vivid memory is that of Nehru's final home, that of the British naval commander of the Indian Ocean Fleet in New Delhi. Actually, it was another British general's home, but you get the point. It was once a grand building, 
kept as a monument with people tramping in and out, it became shabby. It is not worth the restoration unless they restore it just for people to look at it. 38 Oxley Road has no merit as architecture, so please respect my wish to have it demolished when I'm no longer around. <coughs> Cabinet noted his letter. A few months later, in January 2011, my father published a book, Hard Truths to Keep Singapore Going. In the book, the question of preserving his house came up. He said, I've told the cabinet, when I'm dead, demolish it. He explained again that he did not want the house to become a shambles. The cross cost of preservation would be high because the house was built over 100 years ago and had no foundation. If the house was demolished and planning rules could change, the value of the land as well as the surrounding plots would go up. However, after Hard Truths was published, there was a strong public pushback. Many Singaporeans did not agree with Mr. Lee. They wanted the house to be preserved. This was, after all, the house of, the, of Singapore's founding prime minister, where important political decisions were made that shaped the future of Singapore. We are a young nation, and what the house represents is of particular significance to our history and nationhood. So in March 2011, my father asked some newspaper editors for their views. All the editors replied that they would like it to be kept given its historical importance and heritage value. Gunto Sadali, then editor of Brita Harian, wrote to my father, I was personally shocked and sad when I first read about you saying that you wanted the house demolished after you are gone. The historical value of the house is priceless. If we demolish it, our next generations will regret it. We should avoid making this mistake. Mr. Lim Jim Kun, then editor of Lian He Zhao Bao, suggested that the house be conserved and turned into a museum like the Sun Yat-sen Memorial Hall. These were not the answers my father hoped to get. My father then wanted to leave the decision to his children. But we told him that only he could decide. He then said his decision was to knock it down. I told him that in that case, he should tell the editors and put it on the record. And so he did. After the general election in May 2011, Mr. Lee retired from the cabinet. He then decided to put his views on the record again. And that is the second letter in the bundle you have, 20th of July, 2011. He wrote to cabinet to reiterate that he wanted the house knocked down. I read it. It says, I have previously written to cabinet that the house should be demolished. It has no foundations and is in poor condition. It is difficult to maintain if people start trampling through the house. Whenever there's piling in Cliney Road for new homes, hairline cracks begin to appear on the walls. So keeping the house is too hazardous and costly. I therefore repeat my wish to have the house demolished when I'm no longer alive. This is the letter which I referred to when I addressed Parliament on the 13th of April 2015 and said he expressed his wish that the house be knocked down. But I misspoke. I said it was December 2015. In fact, he wrote this on the 20th of July Sorry, not 2015. I said December 2011. In fact, he wrote this on the 20th of July, 2011. When I saw this letter the next morning, that means 21st of July, 2011, I immediately invited Mr. Lee to make his case in person to Cabinet. I thought that with his force of personality and conviction, meeting the ministers would give him the best chance to convince Cabinet as he had done so many times before. My father agreed to come. He met the cabinet that very afternoon. But the ministers were unanimous in expressing their opposition to knocking the house down. I was the only one who did not express a view because I was both a son and the PM, and therefore conflicted. After the meeting, my father continued to ponder over how to deal with the house. In fact, even before the cabinet meeting, 
he had been discussing with a family how to go about demolishing the house and redeveloping the site. We explored in the family all kinds of permutations to demolish the house and redevelop the site, maximize value. We discussed who to inherit the property, whether it should be one of the children, several of the children, whether to demolish the house before or after my father died, whether to donate the proceeds to charity after the site was redeveloped, and if so, which children would share in the donation and which charities to donate to. At one point, my brother suggested that my father gift the property to Singapore, subject to the condition that the house be demolished and a small public park be built in its place. I said that I thought this was worth considering. But I offered another option, to demolish the house and redevelop the site as my father wanted, but then to sell off the property and donate the proceeds to charity. I asked my father between the two which he preferred, and he replied, the latter. In other words, demolish the house, redevelop, sell off, and donate the proceeds to charity. He had even had some ideas which charities he wanted. <clears throat> he was a practical-minded man. In August 2011, about a month after the Cabinet meeting, my father decided to will 38 Oxley Road to me as part of my share of the estate, and he told the family so. Ho Ching and I knew my father's wishes and also my mother's feelings. We also knew how cabinet and the public viewed the matter. We started discussing alternatives with my father to see how best we could fulfill his wishes in the event that the house could not be demolished. My father's was concern was that the house should not become run down and dilapidated and that it should not be an expensive burden to maintain. My late mother had a different concern, privacy. She felt strongly that her private living spaces should always remain private. She had been most distressed at the thought of people tramping through her personal spaces after she and my father passed away to gawk at how they had lived. Even when not so familiar people came into the house for one reason or the other to meet her or my father, she would complain afterwards, you could see them looking around, eyes open, to try and find out how we live. And she, she resented it. So Ho Ching and I came up with a proposal to renovate the house, to change the inside completely. Demolish the private living spaces to preserve the privacy of the family. Keep the basement dining room, which was of historical significance. Strengthen the structure which was decaying and create a new and separate living area so that the house could be lived in. My father accepted this proposal. In December 2011, he told the family that it was best to redevelop 38 Oxley Road straight away after he died and do what we proposed. By redevelopment, he means remove the private spaces, renovate the house, but without knocking it down. At around the same time, on the 27th of December, he wrote to Cabinet a third time, and you have the letter with you. Cabinet members were unanimous that 38 Oxley Road should not be demolished as I wanted. I have reflected on this and decided that if 38 Oxley Road is to be preserved, it needs to have its foundations reinforced and the whole building refurbished. It must then be let out for people to live in. An empty building will soon decline and decay. Ho Ching and I therefore proceeded along these lines. We kept the family fully informed of our considerations and our intentions. We emailed everyone, including my father, my sister, my brother, his wife. No one raised any objections to the plan. My father met the architect, went through the proposal, and approve the scheme to reinforce the foundations and renovate the house. Madam Speaker, may I now ask the clerk to distribute handout two 
which contains the relevant correspondence. Yes, please. So you see the cover, the first page is my father's authorization letter to the architect to submit the development application. He signed it on the 28th of March, 2012. I hereby authorize you to act as my agent to submit on my behalf an application to the competent authority under the Planning Act 1998 for a written permission to develop lot 99909X TS20 that means Town Subdivision 20, at 38 Oxley Road, for proposed additions and alterations to existing two-storey detached dwelling house, River Valley Planning Area, and so on. I hereby authorize you to pay on my behalf to the competent authority all processing fees or charges payable by me in connection with the application. And you already approved it a few weeks later on the 17th of April, 2012. You have that too. I have just given you the first page of the grant of written permission. The rest is the fine print. But the first page puts the specifics, uh, puts the key points. Name and address of developer, Lee Kuan Yew, 38 Oxley Road. Date application received, and so on. Particulars of decision, planning permission is granted under section 14 brackets 4 of the Planning Act for the application referred to Details are set out in part three, subject to conditions in part four, additional notes in part five. As far as I knew, that was how the family had settled the matter. Rationally, amicably, while Mr. Lee was still alive, which is what he had hoped to achieve and strived very hard to achieve. I heard nothing to the contrary until after my father died. My father passed away on the 23rd of March, 2015. On the 12th of April, 2015, three weeks later, his last will was formally read to me and my two siblings. 38 Oxley Road was given to me. The demolition clause was in the will. And Madam Speaker, may I now ask the clerk to distribute handout three, which is the demolition clause. Yes, please. <coughs> The demolition clause was in two main parts with a third minor part at the end. I read it out in full. I further declare that it is my wish and the wish of my late wife, Kwa Gyok Chu, that our house at 38 Oxley Road, Singapore 238629, the house, be demolished immediately after my death, or if my daughter, Wei Ling, would prefer to continue living in the original house immediately after she moves out of the house. I would ask each of my children to ensure our wishes with respect to the demolition of the house be carried out. If our children are unable to demolish the house as a result of any changes in the laws, rules, or regulations binding them, it is my wish that the house never be open to others except my children, their families, and descendants. My view on this has been made public before and remains unchanged. My statement of wishes in this paragraph seven may be publicly disclosed, notwithstanding that the rest of my will is private. This whole thing is one paragraph seven, but I've broken it up so you can see the different sections. The following day, I had to speak in Parliament on how we would honour Mr Lee Kuan Yew. The question of 38 Oxley Road was bound to come up. There were already suggestions from the public on what to do with the house, including turning it into a museum, and a memorial. I was personally in a difficult position because I was both Mr. Lee's son and the Prime Minister. So at the reading of the will, I discussed with my siblings what I could say about the House in Parliament. There was a difference of views. Sien Yang, for the first time, objected to the renovation plans that my father had approved. 
he wanted the house to be knocked down immediately. This was a complete surprise to me. I pointed out that his position now was different from what the family had discussed and agreed upon. But it was not possible to knock down the house immediately anyway, because my sister, Wailing, then said she intended to continue to stay in the house. And in his will, my father had expressed his wish that Wailing be allowed to stay there for as long as she wished. So I said we should honour that, and that I would say in Parliament the next day that the government would not make any decision until such time as my sister was no longer staying there. We also discussed what I should say regarding my father's wishes. What I should say in Parliament regarding my father's wishes. I wanted to read out Mr Lee's 27 December 2011 letter to the Cabinet, stating his view on what to do with a house if it is to be preserved. I also wanted to read out the demolition clause in his will in full. My brother and his wife objected strenuously. But I decided that I had to do so, and I said so, so that my father's views would be on the record and Singaporeans could know accurately what his thinking had been. Later that evening, I discovered that my siblings had issued a statement which contained the full demolition clause. In Parliament the next day, I made a statement which I had cleared with my key cabinet colleagues because I was speaking as Prime Minister. I read out both a letter to Cabinet and the whole demolition clause. I said, we should not rush into making decisions on this matter, especially so soon after Mr. Lee has passed away. We should allow some time to pass, consider the ideas carefully, and make calm, considered decisions which will stand the test of time. We want to honour Mr. Lee but we must do so in the right way. I stated that my father's position on 38 Oxley Road had been unwavering all these years, that he wanted the house knocked down, and that as a son, I wanted to see my father's wishes carried out. I told Parliament that since my sister was going to continue living in 38 Oxley Road, there was no immediate issue of demolition and no need for government to make any decision now. As and when my sister was no longer living there, the government of the day would consider the matter. After the parliament sitting, I took two major steps. One, I recused myself from all government decisions relating to 38 Oxley Road. <coughs> I was conflicted, being my father's son and the inheritor of the house and also the head of the government. It was not proper for me to take part in any decisions on 38 Oxley Road. So at the next cabinet meeting, two days after the parliament sitting, I recused myself from all discussions and decisions relating to the house and placed DPM Teo Chi Hien in charge. And this was formally recorded in the cabinet minutes. From that point on, I have been out of the loop whenever the government handles matters concerning the house. I play no part in any of the discussions or decisions Whenever Cabinet deliberates on the House, for example, when it set up a ministerial committee, I absent myself and DPMTO chairs the meeting. My second major action after my father died was to divest myself of the House. Soon after the Parliament sitting, I learned that my siblings were unhappy that I was getting the House. I was not sure why, but I thought the best way to resolve the matter was to transfer the house to them. I first offered to transfer the house to my sister for a nominal sum of one dollar, on condition that if the property is sold later or acquired by the government, all proceeds or compensation would go to charity. Unfortunately, that deal fell through. Subsequently, I made a fresh proposal to sell the house to my brother at fair market value. <clears throat> this time we reached agreement, this was December 2015, and we also agreed that my brother and I would each donate half the value of the house to charity. We both did so, and in addition, I topped up another half myself. Uh, in other words, 
I myself gave away the full value of the house that I had inherited, and together my brother and I have donated one and a half times the value of the house to charity. So if you understand that properly, the house comes to me, I sell it to my brother for the market value, he gives me the value of the house, so many dollars. I give half of that dollars to charity. He gets the house. In addition, he gives half the, the same amount, half the value of the house to charity. On top of that, I separately gave half the value of the house to charity, so I gave one times the value. He gave away one half times the value. The house is with him. And that complicated arrangement substantially addressed a major concern of mine that was that our family be seen not to be benefiting financially from 38 Oxley Road, either through receiving compensation from the state for acquisition or resisting acquisition or preservation, conservation, to profit by redeveloping and selling the property. I've given you the background to 38 Oxley Road, our discussions when my father was alive and what happened after my father passed away. Where does the matter stand today? There is, in substance, no longer anything for my siblings and me to dispute over on the matter of the house. We all want our father's personal wish to be carried out, which is to knock the house down. I no longer have any interest in the house. My brother owns it. I do not take part in any government decisions on the house. So why is there still an argument? I really am not sure, but one possible factor may be a difference in views between me and my siblings. And the difference is over this question. What did my father think about the house apart from demolition? Was his view black and white, all or nothing? Demolish the house no matter what. Or was he prepared to consider alternatives should demolition not be possible? My siblings' view is that my father absolutely wanted to demolish the house with no compromise. And they point to the first half of the demolition clause as evidence. That's the first <coughs> section you have in the handout. And they say that if he considered any alternatives, such as the next section on the handout, that was only because he was under duress, because the government had the power to prevent him or his heirs from knocking it down. My view is that while my father wanted the house to be demolished, he was prepared to consider alternatives should the government decide otherwise. Indeed, he put it in writing and approved alternative architectural plans which were submitted to URA, as I explained earlier, and approved by URA. And next, we have to look at the full demolition clause and not just the first half. And the full clause shows that my father did accept alternatives. Further, I have pointed out some unusual circumstances surrounding how the last will was prepared which are relevant because of the weight that my siblings put on the demolition clause in the last will. Despite this difference in views, I still see no need for argument. I've submitted my views to the ministerial committee. My siblings have submitted theirs. We have commented on each other's views. I will leave it in the good hands of the committee. In any case, the government has stated that the committee will not make any decisions on the House and will not even recommend, recommend any decisions on the House to Cabinet. The committee will only list options for the House so that when a decision does become necessary one day, perhaps decades from now, the Cabinet of the day, most likely by then under a different Prime Minister, will have these options available to consider. There is therefore no reason at all for anybody to feel pushed into a corner by the committee, as my brother has claimed to be. Regrettably, my siblings have now gone public and accused me of abusing my office. There are 
very few specifics in their charges, but because their father, their father is Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, their accusations gain some credibility, and I have to take their charges seriously, which is why I'm addressing them here in Parliament. What are the allegations? First, alleged abuse of power. My siblings have given scant details of the charge, but my brother has cited as a prime example the setting up of the ministerial committee. I have already explained that I have recused myself. DPMTO is in charge of this matter. I had nothing to do with the decision to set up the ministerial committee. I do not give any instructions to the ministerial committee or its members. My only dealing with the committee has been to respond to their request in writing by formal correspondence, no different from my siblings' dealings with the committee. And this is the right and proper way to handle a conflict of interest. My siblings argue that even though I have recused myself, the ministers are my subordinates, and therefore the ministerial committee cannot be independent from me. In fact, they say this of parliament itself. And this cannot be right, because if the ministers are subordinate and can't be independent, not, the cap ministerial committee cannot be independent, then the cabinet minus me cannot be independent, the government minus me cannot be independent. What is the process for dealing with a matter concerning the prime minister's personal matters? But the process which we have embarked on, me recusing myself and the cabinet minus me dealing with the matter, is the standard way, the standard practice for a person facing a potential conflict of interest. He takes himself out from handling the matter. He doesn't participate in making any decisions about it. He lets somebody else deal with it. It could be his deputy. It could be some other senior colleague. Be, it could be the rest of the cabinet, as in this case. And this is exactly what I have done in the case of 38 Oxley Road. I myself do not deal with the matter at all. I take no part in the discussions or decisions concerning the House. DPMTO is in full charge. Ministers and officials report to and take directions from DPMTO on all 38 Oxley Road matters. Suppose instead that I had decided as PM to knock down the house and had pushed that decision through without allowing the government to consider the alternatives, weigh the considerations and go through due process just because it was what my father wanted. That would have been a real abuse of power. That would have gone against the whole system of rules and values that Mr. Lee Kuan Yew spent his whole life upholding and building up. The second issue my siblings accuse me of is separate from the house itself. After my father passed away, my siblings gifted artifacts from 38 Oxley Road to the National Heritage Board. This was formalized in a deed of gift. My siblings have accused me of improperly obtaining this deed, which was between them and the National Heritage Board, and they say I obtained the deed as PM and gave it to my lawyers, and that was wrong, but I disagree. The deed was signed by my sister and brother, who were acting for my father's estate. I was one of the beneficiaries of the estate. I was entitled to be consulted by my siblings before they did this, but I was not consulted. In June 2015, Minister Lawrence Wong updated me on a major SG50 exhibition on our founding fathers. And he told me the exhibition included artifacts from Oxley Road and described the conditions attached to the gift. Subsequently, he gave me the deed, which I had not seen before. As Prime Minister, I had every right to see it. After reading the deed, I became very concerned over what NHB had agreed to. The terms were onerous and unreasonable to NHB. For example, whenever NHB displayed the items, it also had to display them with the first half of the demolition clause. 
only the first half, which said Mr. Lee wanted the house knocked down, and not the second half of the clause, which stated what Mr. Lee wanted done if the house could not be knocked down. And this partial selective disclosure would mislead the public on Mr. Lee's intentions. Furthermore, my siblings had announced publicly that this was a gift. But in fact, they had set conditions in the fine print. If any time the terms of the deed were breached, my siblings could immediately take back all the items for one dollar. Therefore, this was not a gift at all. They had misled the public. Mr. and Mrs. Lee Kuan Yew had gifted many items to NHB during their lives, and they had never imposed any conditions on their gifts remotely like these. What Li Wei Ling and Li Xian Yang had imposed on NHB was wrong. Discovering all this as Prime Minister, I had to act. Otherwise, people might wrongly think I was party to this. It's nonsensical to say that because I saw the deed in my official capacity, I could not raise the matter with a family member. If I come across anyone doing something wrong, even family, maybe especially family, it is my duty to put a stop to it and set them right if I can. In the same way, if any minister discovers in the course of his official work that a family member is dealing improperly with some government agency or seeking to take advantage of the government, surely the minister must take this up with a family member and get him or her to stop. That's what the code of conduct is for. This is expected of anyone in a public position, especially me as prime minister. I therefore wrote to my siblings through lawyers to object to what they had done. And on the government side, I told Lawrence Wong to take instructions from DPM Teo Chi Hien on this matter. I believe this was the correct and proper way for me to handle the deed of gift. Third, my siblings have made allegations about nepotism concerning my wife and son, Hong Yi, and that I want 38 Oxley Road kept standing in order to inherit my father's credibility and bolster my standing. Hong Yi, my son, has publicly said he's not interested in politics, nor have I pushed him to enter politics. My wife, Ho Ching, is CEO of Damasic Holdings. As CEO, she reports to the board chaired by Mr. Lim Boon Heng. As a company, Tamasic Holdings answers to its shareholder, the Ministry of Finance, under Minister Heng Sui Kiat. I have every confidence that both Mr. Lim Boon Heng and, Mr. L and Minister Heng Sui Kiat understand the meaning of good, proper corporate governance. It is the Tamasic board which appoints the CEO and the appointment has to be confirmed by the President, who is advised by the Council of Presidential Advisers. If Ho Ching ever behaves improperly, I have no doubt that the, that the Tamasic Board, the President, and the CPA know what their duty is. Regarding the House and how its continued existence enhances my aura as Prime Minister, if I needed such magic properties to bolster my standing after 13 years as a Prime Minister, I must be in a, in a pretty sad state. And if Singaporeans believe that such magic works in Singapore, I think Singapore will be in, in an even sadder state. Now, Madam Speaker, may I have your permission to say some words in Mandarin? Yes, please. Jin Tian. 我是以沉痛的心情
已经很不幸。更不幸的是，李光耀先生一辈子辛辛苦苦建立起来的精神资产，可能一夜之间就被毁了。而这种精神资产是无价的。大家因此希望我们大事化小，尽快结束这场无谓的争吵。大家的这种感受我完全理解。其实我何尝不想大事化小，让纠纷平息下来？然而，我的弟妹的联合声明，谈论的不仅是家事，他们还刻意重伤我的人格，败坏政府的声誉。影响了人民对政府的信任，我不得不做出回应，驳斥这些毫无根据的指责。我在英语的演讲中详细的解释了这场纠纷的来龙去脉，其实只是概括的解释了这场纠纷的来龙去脉。我还说明。在父亲过世后的这些年，身为李家的长子，我尊敬也愿意遵从父亲的遗愿，我也竭尽所能化解跟弟妹之间的分歧。身为总理，我必须照顾国家的利益，让政府公正的处理李光耀先生故居的后续。在这双重身份之间，我出于两难。但我尽力做到公私分明。身为政府领导人，我在处理这件事的时候，让自己完全置身事外，把家事和公事分得清楚。父亲过世不到一个月，我就让张志贤副总理全权处理这个问题，我完全不过问，也不参与。每当内阁讨论故居的事项，包括成立部长委员会，我都刻意回避，不出席也不参加他们的讨论。作为家中的长子，我有责任维护父母的家和家庭的名誉。我的父亲遗嘱中把欧斯里路的房屋留给我，后来我发现这让弟妹很不满。为了安抚安抚他们，我向他们提议，由我将房子转让给妹妹，代价是象征性的，一块钱。很可惜，他们没接受这个建议。过后，我把房子转卖给弟弟，并且将我卖屋所得全部捐给慈善。我不想从这个房子获得任何金钱上的利益。我原本以为我放弃了房子的权利，置身事外，能够让我的弟弟妹感到满意。我万万没想到，他们会不顾家庭的声誉，将家庭纠纷公诸于世，并且对我做人身攻击，对政府做毫无根据的指责。作为哥哥，我真的。不知道自己还该做些什么，还能做些什么。但是作为总理，我知道，我不能够为了息事宁人，而对他们的指责置之不理，因为这些指责损害了人民对政府的信任，也影响了新加坡的国际形象。因此，我必须在国会。澄清事实，说明真相，表达我和我的团队捍卫清廉政治和依法办事的决心。国会是议论国事的庄严场所，议员可以自由地在这里向政府问责，做出批判。李光耀先生也曾经面对同样的局面。多年前，我们父子两人。曾经因为购买私人房地产而招惹一些非议，使政府的信誉受到质疑。当时吴作栋先生是总理，他的政府要求我和我父亲到国会
向人民清楚交代，接受议员的一切质询。那一场国会辩论，化解了人民对政府的疑虑，使到政府能够继续获得人民的信任。今天，我要坦坦荡荡地接受议员的质询、问责。这当然包括反对党议员。我一定要把事情说清楚，以消除任何疑惑。我们的家事关系到情绪的问题，很难得到圆满的解决。不过，我还是希望有朝一日，我们能够和解。但国事为先，我必须维持人民对政府的信任，向人民保证。这还是一个清廉有效、大公无私的政府，因为这是新加坡赖以生存的最宝贵的资产。对于这场家庭纠纷所引起的困扰、混淆和不安，我再次向大家道歉。我希望这次的国会辩论将有助于平息这场不幸的风波。我和我的领导团队。会继续全力以赴，为大家服务。Madam Speaker, may I now continue in English? Yes, please. I have brought this matter to Parliament because Singaporeans are entitled to a full answer from me and my government. Parliament may not be a court of law, but it is the highest body in the land. It is also where my government and I are accountable to MPs and to the people of Singapore. Many people have asked me why I am not taking legal action to challenge the will or sue for defamation or take some other legal action to put a stop to this and clear my name. These are valid questions. I took advice. I considered my options very carefully. I believe I have a strong case. In normal circumstances, in fact, in any other imaginable circumstance than this, I would have sued immediately. Because the accusation of the abuse of power is a very grave one, however baseless it may be. And it is, in fact, an attack not just on me, but on the integrity of the whole government. But suing my own brother and sister in court would further be smirched our parents' names. At the end of the day, we are brother and sister, and we are all our parents' children. It would also drag out the process for years and cause more distraction and distress to Singaporeans. Therefore, fighting this out in court cannot be my preferred choice. Every family will understand that family disputes do happen, but they are not something to flaunt in public. That's why I've done my best to deal with this out of the public eye. For example, I kept my submissions to the ministerial committee private. My purpose was not to pursue a fight with my siblings, but to assist the committee in its work. Unfortunately, my siblings made public allegations against me, and then I had no choice but to defend myself and release the statements and the facts about the matter. I stand by the statements I have published, but I really don't want to go further if I can help it. Today, I'm making this statement in Parliament to account to members and to Singaporeans and to deal with this issue expeditiously so that Singaporeans can understand what it is all about and we can put the matter to rest, I hope, once and for all. DPMTO will be making a ministerial statement after me. He will explain his and the government's actions and decisions on this matter. Other relevant ministers will speak too. I invite members to raise all questions, suspicions, or doubts directly in this chamber with me and my team. I've seen the questions filed by the Workers' Party MPs. It's striking that the questions are general and concern broad principles and rules. They contain no specific allegations or facts about any wrongdoing or impropriety. But if I'm mistaken and the Workers' Party has come across such allegations or facts, please raise them today. 
my ministers and I will deal with all their questions and give comprehensive answers because we have nothing to hide. I have told the PMPs that I'm lifting the party whip. Strictly speaking, there's no whip to lift because there's no vote to be taken. But I said this to emphasize what I expect from this debate, a robust questioning and a full airing and accounting of the public issues and allegations. All MPs, whether you are PAP MPs, opposition MPs or NMPs, should query me and my ministers vigorously and without restraint. That is a way to dispel all the doubts, innuendo and tittle-tattle that has been planted and circulated. That is the way to strengthen confidence in our institutions and our system of government and refocus our energies on the challenge that we face as a nation. The legacy of Mr. Lee is much more than an old house. Mr. Lee's legacy is Singapore and the values that we uphold. We've built something special in Singapore, a cohesive, multiracial, meritocratic society, a fair and just society where the same rules apply to everybody, whether you're a minister or an ordinary citizen, whether you are the prime minister or the children of the founding prime minister. You are not above the law. My colleagues and I are in politics, in government, to fight to uphold this legacy to keep Singapore successful. We have sworn to serve Singapore faithfully. When private interests and public duties clash, we make sure that our private interests do not sway our public decisions. When allegations of impropriety and corruption are made, we take them seriously and investigate them fully. Ministers are bound by a code of con conduct which is tabled in Parliament. And after every general election, I issue rules of prudence to every PAP MP so that they know how to conduct themselves to protect their own reputation and to safeguard the integrity of the PAP government and the Singapore system. In Singapore, everyone is equal before the law. Mr. Lee understood this most of all. When the dust has settled on this unhappy episode, people must know that the government in Singapore operates transparently, impartially, and properly. That in Singapore, even Mr. Lee's house and Mr. Lee's wishes are subject to the rule of law. That the government he built is able to withstand intense and sustained attacks on its reputation and integrity and emerge not just untainted, but in fact strengthened. This is the house that Mr. Lee built, not 38 Oxley Road. When Mr. Lee was asked what were the most important things to him in life, he said, my family and my country. It pains me that this episode has put both under a cloud and done damage to Singapore. I hope one day I'll be able to resolve the unhappiness within the family. But today I stand here before you to answer your questions, clear any doubts, and show you that you have every reason to maintain your trust in me and my government. My colleagues and I will continue to serve you and work with you as we have always done to the best of our ability. Thank you, Madam Speaker.